Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Welcome to Long Story Short. The Keolana Ohana of Makaha is a family of watermen and women who've grown up in and around the ocean. It's infused every cell of who they are. Our guest is Brian Keolana, who at age 46 is following in the wake of his dad, Buffalo, as a living legend. Brian is carving out an international reputation as a big wave rider, Hollywood stuntman, ocean risk management expert, inventor, and businessman. Let's drop in on my conversation with Brian Keolana. Tell me, where exactly did you grow up on Makaha Beach? Dead center, um, right on Macaw Beach. He used to have a two-story house that my father was the park keeper at that time uh, in 1960, and then I was born in 61. And um, as far back as I can remember in that picture window is looking out and seeing sand and ocean and giant surf and, you know, growing up, the uh, ocean was my background right there. The ocean's always changing. How do you uh, make sure that you cover yourself in the water? Yeah, I, I guess it's like, you know, for, for anybody, it's like, you know, you got computer techs, you know, they understand every single component in their computer. And as the same for, you know, us in the ocean, we understand, you know, the creation cause and effect of the ocean, what water does, and, you know, why it moves in certain ways, and how the undertows work, and all those kind of things. It's, you know, God, you know, it's not even second nature, it's like first hand information for us. So, you know, we know how to relax. We know how to be comfortable, which makes us confident, you know. So it's, again, you know, it's our home. It's our playground. It's a place where, you know, I can deal with a chaotic day and jump in the ocean, just release all that bad energy and come back fresh and new. And uh, I bet you know the underside of Makaha Beach like, like I know the back of my hand. I mean, you know what it looks like every nook and cranny down there in the reef? Pretty much, you know, I, I think that's the thing that my father taught all of us guys was that, you know, make it your home as well as, you know, people can close their eyes and, you know, find their way to the kitchen blindfolded. It's the same with us guys. We know every single crack and, you know, rock and currents and swells and direction of the swells and wind, you know, all those things and stuff like that was our playground for us guys. You know, I remember when I was a small kid, you know, my father was a park keeper, but we used to play in a rip and make it like fun. And then the tourists would follow us guys and they end up getting sucked out in a rip. My dad would rescue them. And, you know, we thought that was fun how much tourists would get caught in a rip, both me and my sister. And then my father kind of caught on as like, you know, got a dirty spanking. <laughs> I guess it could have been a really daunting experience having a, a legendary father. Yeah, you know, my dad, you know, it's like, you get people all the time, you know, just when you're growing up, you know, it's gonna be hard, you know, following your father's footsteps. But dad was one where, you know, he, he doesn't force you to follow his footsteps, you know. He always, you know, planned us and said, walk on the side and make your own footsteps, you know. Learn from me, but learn your own path also too. Are you different from him as a waterman? Um, I, I think we're all different, you know, all me and my brothers and sisters and everyone, you know, in, in our own individual ways, you know, we all come up with our own different identities. But, you know, dad's a, a, a hard act to follow, you know, all the common sense and the knowledge that, that he has, you know. I, I think, you know, it's great that, you know, we got nephews and nieces and, you know, my kids that he's passing on that information. <clears throat> he just bought, you know, two sailboats because he taught us a lot about canoe paddling and diving and how to survive in the ocean, how to have fun in the ocean, how to work in the ocean. And he's still passing it on to, you know, all his grandkids, you know, and it's just, you know, an, a neat legacy, I think, for all of us guys. When you were growing up, the ocean was not just your recreation. It was uh, probably a food source. Yeah. It was, it was entertainment because money was scarce. You know, money wasn't an, an item for us guys when we was growing up. You know, if we was hungry, we we was always fed, we was always full. My dad, you know, the ocean was in a supermarket. He would go out and when he said you was the bag boy, that was hard work because you would be out there and freezing and, you know, picking up all this fish and, and squid and, you know, whatever's out there and stuff too. And, and he would feed the whole beach, you know, whoever wanted to eat. So guys would go and you get the wood, you make the fire, you, you know, get this and prepare, you know, whatever. And everybody would just 
eat, you know, and have fun and play music and and surf. And, and I think that's the great thing about where I live still to today, that it still exists, you know, down on the Leeward side. We still practice our family values. We still practice our culture. We, you know, the ocean is our icebox, but we also teach, you know, the younger generation to, you know, respect the ocean and, and don't pollute the ocean because, you know, you get what you give, you know. And you give what you get. And, and you see people littering the ocean and littering the land, they, you know, right, right near a landfill, they'll, they'll dump stuff yeah. nearby. Why do you think people do that? Especially in, in their land. I, you know, I think they disconnect themselves, people, you know, they, they don't think they affect, you know, uh, the, the outside, you know, world. They think they're just isolated within their own, you know, yard or house or whatever and don't think about what's being, you know, flushed in the storm drains or, you know, what's going into the ocean and, you know, what's affecting and stuff too. You know, they might go to the supermarket and buy one fish or buy something and end up that piece of plastic they threw down, you know, they eat themselves, you know. But I, I think it's a lack of education, you know, and I think that's one word that I, you know, teach somebody in the next generation of respect. You know, respect is another word of education, you know. You won't, you know, go and, uh, you know, fight the, the greatest uh, mixed martial art guy without, you know, studying his strengths and weaknesses. That's not giving him respect. You know, same with the ocean. You won't go out in the ocean and not understanding all this, you know, beauty and the beast, all these dangers that exist out there. That's not giving the ocean respect. That's why we always say, you know, don't turn your back to the ocean. And really what we're saying is, you know, understand the dangers, you know, don't, you know, just you know, let it go and, and, you know, go in la la land because you're going to get looped for one, yeah, and whacked into reality. And you've rescued people who showed none of that interest in respecting and studying and learning more. They just got taken in by a beautiful ocean, a nice day, and then got into big trouble. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and like I said, you know, it's a lot in the mind of people of what their, their fantasies and their dreams are. You know, they come from far off places and they fly on a plane and they're looking at beautiful girls and beautiful beaches and swaying palm trees and hula girls and you know perfect surf and and they want to fulfill their fantasy and when they come here and they jump in the water and they, they get wacky with reality you know they don't understand the dangers they don't uh, understand the abilities or have the right equipment you know again they don't have respect you know and then that's what happens and that's when they get in trouble you know and, and then you have to get you know lifeguards or educated people and, and not just um, the lifeguards but you know the great thing now is a lot of the surfers now you know uh, participate in assisting in, in rescues or um, you know pointing dangers out and trying not to you know um, get into a bad situation. Lifeguards know how fast a day at the shoreline can go from pretty to pretty ugly. Brian Kaolana tells an amazing story about a rescue effort in high surf at Rocky Sea Caves near Kaena Point. PBSHawaii.org is your online resource for program schedules and information on PBS shows and local productions. Log on and connect to Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox to download transcripts from this and all episodes. Get online and get interactive at PBSHawaii.org. You're known for a lot of things, but one of the things that really puts you on the map is that jet ski rescue uh, in the Kaena Point area, a uh, guy trapped in a sea cave. Can you tell that story? Oh, God. <laughs> I was going to make him short. Um, well, you know, we got on call from 911. I was um, working at Macaw Beach. and As a lifeguard? As a lifeguard. And uh, we responded, you know, swimming in distress. So you know, we're thinking, okay, big surf, but it's probably an easy rescue. That's what you know. We kind of thought. Went there, and it turned out not not easy at all. Um, this guy was trapped in a lava tube, sea cave, and he was in there for two and a half hours, and dodging between the giant surf and swells and tides coming up, and you know the emotion of help me, help me, and you can't get them, and everybody's yelling at you, get them, get them, and you know it's. It's, I think, that emotional roller coaster. And I think also getting to the part where you train yourself so much that you block off the emotion side. Don't let your emotions control your actions. 
you know, kind of let your, you know, your body go on autopilot, you know, and that's kind of what protects us guys, you know, the common sense of what can be done. Because the worst is escalation of how you can make matters worse, where we could have one person calling for help, we could have two persons, three persons calling for help with an you know, 800 pound you know, jet ski inside of that cave. So I think that that was going through our thought in minds and also realizing, um, making an opportunity of when we can get him. And it was just lucky that when he came out, um, it was a microsecond that we could grab him because if it was any later, we wouldn't have got him. This trapped guy wasn't anywhere close. He had, there was some swimming that needed to be done in the cave. It was a big cave. Yeah, there's like three different chambers in a cave and he was in the furthest chamber on the right side. And actually he was underwater in every wave that pushes through. And he was all cut up. He was all cut up. He was, yeah, he was in bad shape, you know. And I, I think what really saved him was um, him being naive enough of what, how bad of a situation it was, but him also being young enough, you know, to hang on. And if you were, if, if it was later, then what would have happened to the rest of you? It, it, it's a fine line of knowing what you can and cannot do, you know, and, and that's what happens in the ocean and stuff too. It's just, you know, there's no room for mistake. You know, it's, you know, kind of do or die of what happens. Yeah. Did you consider, you know what, I, I'm really good, but I just, this is an impossible situation. Some things you cannot save. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, for us guys, knowing of what we can do, it's, again, running that line. And we train to run that edge, run that line. With, Did you think you know, in that case, okay, maybe maybe this is a situation that is not meant to be handled? No, not really, because you, if you got any doubts, that's when you can get hurt. You know, if you got any doubt in your ability, any doubt in your partners, any doubt in your equipment, then that's, that's when you're in trouble. After that rescue, with a split second to, to spare, what did um, your rescue victim say to you? Your, what did the survivors say? Oh, <laughs> oh God. I, you know, I, I think he, he said everything just in his eyes. You know, I, I, I know he said thanks, you know, but it, it's funny because, you know, after so long, you know, words kind of die out, but the emotion's still there, you know, and just the feeling of actually grabbing them and, and and taking them out of harm's way because once once we had them, it's like you know this big weight lifted off and you know, all that adrenaline was pumping was you know just finally kind of release. I I, I think I never sleep till like two o'clock in the morning, you know, just buzzing from the whole thing. Yeah. What was the margin of safety on that one? Oh, none. Yeah, I mean it was it was that that fine line, you know, it's just running that fine line. Yeah, I I think on that day it was. You know, it was, it was luck, knowledge, and you know, a lot of the God watching on on us guys. Have you ever gone under for so long? Have you ever, have you ever come close to just never coming up again? Yeah, yeah, many times. There's, many times, you say it so casually. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the thing and stuff too. I, I guess, you know, like, we was just you know, training today, just, you know, doing, breath holding exercise, um, you know, underwater rock running, a couple of my friends. And it's, you know, surfing's easy, surviving's hard. You know, it's all that, you know, learning, uh, you know, about wiping out, learning about your, your body, learning about how to relax, how to control your breathing, you know, all those kind of things. And I think, you know, it's, it's at that level that you kind of, you know, have a lot more confidence and yourself so you can bring people out of danger. You know, where you gotta make rescues. So when you, I know you're a waterman, which means you're at home in the water no matter what. You always know how to react. Um, are some watermen uh, mostly surfers or do, is a waterman the kind of guy who does anything? You know, I think anybody who really, you know, it's like my father put it best. If you can you know, fend for yourself, feed, for, feed yourself and other people, have fun and um, you know make it to you know where it's just a enjoyable thing and then then you truly don't want a man you know but if you rating yourself that you know I surf a, a six six surfboard and a, a bodyboard and you know in, in different type of equipment then you know you're basing them off the equipment not off you know the knowledge that you have or the values you have 
And, and I think on True Water Man is really on the values that they have, you know. An abiding love and knowledge of the ocean, a steadfast connection with his ohana and family values. These things are at the core of who Brian Keolana is. And as we'll see, they form the foundation of his professional life as well. Get interactive with Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Log on to pbshawaii.org and connect to Long Story Short to see who's scheduled to appear in upcoming episodes. Submit questions for them and submit suggestions for future guests. Get involved and get interactive with pbshawaii.org. You've always, always made your passion your livelihood. Mm -hmm. Your living has always revolved around the ocean and first you, you, you're a lifeguard but then you've parlayed your skills into other businesses and other realms. Can you list a few of the things you've done with your water skills? <laughs> well, you know, I think the biggest thing with me is my greatest strength is knowing my weaknesses. And whatever I was weak at, I would strengthen. You know, whether again in, in sports or in like, I like challenges. If it was on tests, I like I wanted to ace the test. You know. So what was the weakness you had to work on? Um, anything. You know, anything would find. If I was weak in in shot boarding when I was young, then I would um, I would strengthen myself in that. You know, I I think one of the key points in, in you know me who I am today was, uh, you know, I had one teacher before and he told me, he said, you know, Brian, if you really like make out in life and stuff too, that you would write down your goals. And I was like, you know, you, when you're young, you're not really thinking. So he would write down goals and, and dreams and he would say, okay, this is on long range goals. Let's shorten it and make attainable goals. And then he would say, you know, what, what would you like to do? Well, I like be on the cover of the Surfer Magazine. I like travel around the world. I like, you know, do all these kind of things. And he goes, well, Let's start off with, okay, what does it take to even surf? And how about a bar of wax? You know, it's okay, you write small things. So he gave me a bar of wax and, you know, said, hell, you know, you got the first attainable goal. And just check them off. So, you know, things I would write down, like, I wanted to win one contest on every surf spot around the island. And then as I was growing up, I started knocking off all those, you know, goals. And then started seeing, like, wow, you know, actually I can move ahead and, and, you know, get into pro surfing and travel and, you know, do all these kind of things. And then the same with work, you know. And, and you know, also too, is, with me, is it's not about working hard, it's about working smarter, you know. Realizing, you know, let my, you know, my money work for me. You know, why should I conform and, and you know, put nine to five and, you know, work and, and do all that? Why not just stay in the ocean and enjoy and let the work come to me? So, you know, that was the kind of things and stuff and started figuring out, you know, well, you know, it has my strengths, then I can turn all this, you know, like, you know, with the movie industry, for example. Um, when I started, I was like 17 years old and I was modeling and doing, you know, small little lifeguard jobs and then I would see other guys getting higher pay and then I would research what that guy does for that pay. Then I started researching on the whole production, you know, and what each, you know, person, whether from the smallest little PA to, you know, the director, producers and all that kind of stuff. And then finding out their pay scale and their duties and responsibilities and, and, you know, so on and so on. And then I started tapping onto all these different things and then... Was your goal the money or excelling or both? I, I think both. I, th I think I like the challenge and stuff too. But I, I also like, you know, that I get into a position where I can spread money around. I can hire people. You know, I can, you know, teach people and stuff like that too. So, you know, like getting to the, the stunt world was an easy thing, you know. Um, a whole bunch of us guys, you know, me, Terry Ahui, uh, Buzzy Kerbox, Slater Hamilton, we got um, invited over for Waterworld. <clears throat> and it was filming on a big island for like eight months and making unbelievable money, you know, back then. But also too, it was, you know, for us it was like play, you know, jumping jet skis and, you know, fights and shooting guns and, you know, diving under the water and, you know, doing all this kind of stuff, which is natural to us guys, you know, and fun and getting paid, you know. So I started learning more about that, you know, and then 
getting more into the, the filming of, you know, how they capture that and learning about camera and camera angles and speed and, you know, and all, the, all the different things of what, you know, the respect of the guys working behind the camera, you know, all the kind of things. And Boy, the, the patience required to do movies must be tough on you because you like action. Yeah, well, yeah, I like action. And then, you know, I think the challenging thing too was, you know, I, I got it, the opportunity of acting also too, you know. Um, Baywatch, um, not sure, a couple other things too. So, you know, working as an actor, I think everybody at first is like, yeah, great, you know, being behind the camera, I mean, in front of the camera and, you know, getting lines and stuff, but it's an art, you know, it's not easy and stuff, you know. And I think the first year when I did Baywatch, they gave me like one liners where, you know, a guy would say, help, and I would say, okay, you know. So I think the second season, you know, I wanted more dialogue to build up my own character. And mm -hmm. they would give me pages. And then I was panicking, going like, oh my God, you know. So then I had acting coaches and I would uh, trade, you know, like um, I had the, uh, the top actors on a set. And I would say, okay, your character is to be the top water man. I'll train you to be on top water man. You train me to be an actor, <laughs> you know, so vice versa. So, you know, again, it's understanding your strengths and weaknesses. and. And, and the whole thing is having fun. You know, I, I think I started learning more about that when I started having fun, yeah. But uh, some of this, I, I'm just thinking that you had a lot of skills, but one of the biggest skills to be successful in any business is the ability to work with people. And at Makaha, you're working with very humble family values, and then you go to the Hollywood scene. How is that? Yeah, you know, I, I think Hollywood and, and places can change you. But I look at it like, you know, I can change them, you know, like, you know, we did different shows and stuff like that, you know, Blue Crush and, you know, Pro Harbor and, you know, when they come into our element, you know, in the ocean and then I, you know, I, as well as we, you know, as uh, my partners and friends, I just lay the law down and tell them this is what it is. And we talk about risks, you know, like I talk about, um, cultural risks, uh, community risks, social risks, uh, physical risks, you know, all those kind of things. And, and I list them on paper so they understand, you know. And that way it gives me the, the latitude to say what goes on and what doesn't go on, you know. And I try to, it's a hard act to balance, but I try to balance all sides, you know, and get people involved and put the, the proper people in a proper channel, you know, so everybody's communicating. and. And really what it is, too, is also bringing out, like, ho'oponopono values, you know, and making them understand why we ho'oponopono, why we talk, you know, why we communicate, you know, those kind of things and stuff, too. You have a new business, a relatively new business, called C4. What does C4 Waterman mean? C4, it's, C4 Waterman is, you know, my two partners, uh, Mike Fox and Todd Bradley, and also with the big help of Dave Parmenter, who shapes all of our boards. It, it's uh, a company you know, on a core values, core four. And it's um, balance, um, endurance, strength, and tradition. You know, those four th values that we hold the, uh, and really, you know, like people say, you know, we, we in the stand-up market, you know, with stand-up paddling, uh, paddling a surfboard with a long canoe paddle. And it's probably the, the biggest rage right now, but what it is, is it's like a combination of of being a waterman. There's canoe paddling, there's surfing, there's balancing. It's like standing on an exercise ball inside of the water and you're working all your core muscles. With surfing, when you're surfing, you paddle out and then you sit and you wait for the sit. When you stand up paddling, you're paddling and engaging all the small little muscles firing. And even when you're waiting, you're still balancing and then you're surfing. So it's 100% of your muscles you know, engaging the whole time. And really, I think the biggest market that tapping us in, in our company is the fitness market, you know, and the paddling market, rather than you know the people that just surf. But um, yeah, the company has grown and it's growing and it's getting bigger and bigger. But again, the biggest thing that we're marketing is really like our core values. Who do you think are some of the the greatest watermen with whom you've worked or lived or known? Um, God, well, you know, of, of course, you know, everybody, we all talk about Duke Anamoku, you know, and again, I, I think really of all of his values that he shared around the world, you know, 
and teaching people and stuff and bringing surfing to where it is and you know and Hawaii on the map and all of his you know um, you know Olympic achievements and stuff too but you know I, I think really um, a lot of my heroes and stuff is like my dad and and a lot of the Waikiki Beach Boys of how Waikiki used to be you know kind of thing and and also you know there's pockets that I feel that it's kind of like how Waikiki used to be you know in Makaha if you give them anything they can sail they can surf they can dive they can pretty much you know water is a natural thing I, I think that's the thing with water man you know it's not um, one selective thing that makes you who you are you know and water women how many water women you know um, I think the water women really is like Rel you know Rel son Rel to me was probably one of the best divers you know people knew her for her surfing but God she could dive you know she could hold her breath and she would bring up some big fish and you know again just like my dad and feed everybody and stuff too my father has always taught us guys that the ocean is the fountain of youth you know for us you know my dad he's uh, 70, 72 going on 17 I think you know still swimming still diving still running still playing you know and I think that's the thing with the, the ocean it keeps us guys young we live in an island culture rarely a day goes by that we don't in some way interact with the ocean even if it's simply knowing whether we're Mauka or Makai for island people the ocean is our touchstone for watermen like Brian Keolana it's something deeper the ocean is a way of being or as Brian puts it, it's not second nature, it's first nature. Mahalo for joining us on Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox with PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. You know, it's funny, I was, I was thinking about my, my dad. I bought him one, uh, the, you know, the Jaku stole water scooters, you know, oh, yeah. bought him for his birthday, me and my friend Greg Barnett. And then um, came down the beach the next day and I see this long black sea serpent line on the water. You're wondering, you know, like, you know, you see turtles or, yeah. you know, you see a shadow of a shark or something, right? So you see this long shadow that's 50 foot long, maybe longer. And I'm going, what the hell is that? And it's my dad with the motor scooter with all his grandkids hanging out to his leg, <laughs> popping up. <laughs> uh.